Hello, hello, welcome back to Let's Talk Lovecraft and Let's Talk Short Stories. It is the day after Thanksgiving, hope you're enjoying your long weekend, but uh, we're already back at it, rolling through the videos, doing our third video for today, and that is another Lovecraft short story review in the form of Pickman's Model. Published in 1927 in Weird Tales for the first time, and of course it's anthologized in many places since then, including this volume right here where I'm pulling all these stories that I've been reading for you from. Uh, this is a fairly short story, not quite as uh, short as the last one I did, uh, but you should be able to read it in under a half hour, so it's an easy, an easy read for a single sitting. Uh, how I recommend you do that, uh, turn the lights down low, maybe turn some music on and prepare to be chilled. Alright, so our narrator is in Boston and he's drinking he heavily with his friend Elliot and relating his experiences with an author named Richard Upton Pickman uh, who was part of the same artist club as the narrator in Boston. The artist has gone missing, um, but he was, he was previously uh, kicked out of the club because he was bringing in these um, very grotesque and um, explicit uh, paintings that were deemed to be too uh, too evil for the um, the polite company of the of the club. Uh, these paintings were often of strange humanoid ghouls with hooked feet and um, uh, messed up faces and fangs and everything that makes um, a good monster. But especially those sort of humanoid, that recognition that it's almost human but not quite, that it's monstrous. Uh, so he's he's making these these paintings and. Um, our narrator is very interested in them. He's he's drawn to them, although they scare him, uh, which I think is a, a hallmark of some of my favorite art. And um, he befriends Pikmin. Pikmin begins to open up to him and reveals eventually that he has a secret uh, second painter's studio um, hidden away under a different name in a dilapidated ancient part of Boston that goes back to the 1600s to the time of paranoia over uh, devil worship and of witch trials and all that um, nonsense that went on, actually in reality. Um, so he takes him to the secret studio, um, takes him into the basement where he does his painting and where he stores his works in progress. And um, as they're walking through, he uh, Pickman tells him the story of how uh, back in those days while <coughs> The Puritans were ruling things and you know, forbidding all of the pleasures of the flesh. That there was also tunnels under these parts of the city where people could travel from building to building, from house to house, um, never seeing the day, light of day, um, engaging in all kinds of wonderful debauchery and of living. I think he calls it living, living more than anybody was really living on the surface with their righteousness. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, he he brings him into his studio. He he shows them um, increasingly uh, twisted paintings. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then eventually takes him right into the room where he does his painting. Uh, he notices there's a camera there and uh, Pickman tells him that he likes to take photographs of backgrounds and then um, use those backgrounds when he comes back and in, in the atmosphere of the um, of the basement where he's working in this old um, dilapidated building uh, that he likes to use the background um, but he needs the the atmosphere of this place to do his actual painting. You can't paint like that uh, when you're living in a lack of luxury um, which is a, a theme that you'll see um, really from from artists today where you know they always say that all great art is made through suffering well you know it, it is hard to do sometimes to do um, to do great things when you're living in a, a place of, of comfort. Um, and it's probably why a lot of, um, a lot of art, artists fall off as to get more famous. <laughs> anyway, um, he, um, he, he starts looking through the paintings and he, he, uh, he, he finds a piece of paper and um, just as he finds it, um, there's sounds in the walls and screechings and uh, Pickman rushes him out of the room but closes the door behind him Pick, uh, the narrator picks that piece of paper and shoves it into his pocket and doesn't look at it yet. And um, there's six gunshots 
and then the door opens again and Pikmin reveals that yeah we've got we've got rats in the walls and your shouting and your fear over the the photos the paintings probably just stirred them up and it's all good now but uh, we should go so Pikmin leads him out and they leave on foot out of the bad section of town and they eventually part ways on a place called Joy Street and that is the last time that our narrator ever sees uh, sees Pikmin again who is now missing so afterwards the narrator he reaches into a pocket he uncrumples that piece of paper and finds a photograph and rather than finding a background photo he finds an actual realistic um, real world photograph of one of these ghouls so rather than painting the backgrounds he's actually photographing these things in real life um, presumably the implication is that they're coming up out of this well um, in his studio and he's getting his photographs then um, that brings us to the end of the story uh, just a few conclusions here um, so does this mean that the well is a gateway to hell or are these things <coughs> physically living in our world in the underground the old underground um, that was abandoned by by most people but um used to occupy be occupied by these um by these people and by these witches and all this underground society um i tend to think that the well itself is a gateway to hell um i think the main the main theme here is that um our narrator he was intrigued um and horrified by these by the grotesqueness of these paintings and um he got off on that he loved that and i think that, that's a lesson that a lot of people should learn today that unfortunately do not know it i think i've i've already known it in my heart forever but a lot of people they um people who are into pop art mainstream art who listen to you know saccharine sugar-coated music and look at prints of I don't know, um, Kincaid, for example, and they only find beauty in obvious beauty. Um, but most of the beauty uh, in our world is in the grotesque, and it's you shouldn't be seeking only to find uh, happy feelings and welcoming feelings. Uh, there's a huge rush to be found in feeling uneasy and feeling scared and that is what H.P. Lovecraft does very very well and that really echoes um my my experience as a uh, as a fan of the arts uh one of my more vivid memories of this is as a uh, probably middle teen years um one of the local radio stations had a late night uh underground heavy metal show for two hours they would play stuff that you could not hear anywhere else in those days before uh before um before the internet and um during the beginning of the second hour of that show for about 20 minutes they would play the darkest of the dark like extreme um underground uh, like sort of barbaric um uh how else would you describe it um primal lo-fi like scandinavian norwegian black metal and it would make you feel so uneasy and i remember laying in my bed with my uh, blanket up over my eyes and just getting the rush of it's like what am i getting into here is this naughty is this wrong is this right but why does it make me feel so fucking awesome so that is that has been my experience uh that um that's that kind of rush of the the slightly profane that gives great art its appeal and that's why i've never been able to relate to you know whatever's going on in the top 40 music or whatever's at the top of the bestseller list so so if you're if you're watching this chances are you get what i'm saying but if by chance you don't get it um now you should <laughs> go out there and find something that makes you feel uh feel strange uneasy frightened because that is where living happens all right guys thank you for tuning in once again uh, this has been let's talk lovecraft and let's talk short fiction 
Uh, third video of the day, probably the last for the day, but I'll definitely be back for you again, maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday. Um, I'm gonna keep rolling through these Lovecraft reviews as long as I can find Lovecraft stories that I have not reviewed yet to cover. And then we'll move on to something else. So, you know, the channel won't always be about Lovecraft. Um, we're all about a lot of things already, but our focus will shift from time to time as um, as interest grows, our interests, personal interests, um, go into certain areas. I've um, been doing some, some Walking Dead reviews lately. That show is going off the air for the winter here pretty soon, so those will go away, but I may bring in something else. Maybe go look at another TV show. i um, interested in doing a lot of more um, music reviews too soon, I think. I've um, been thinking about uh, talking about some Blind Guardian fantasy uh, power metal band that does a lot of stuff about Tolkien that would fit into our Let's Talk Tolkien section. Of course, uh, we talked about it a little bit the other day, but there's a lot of stuff out there music-wise that um, gets into the realm of H.P. Lovecraft. I talked about Cradle of Filth. Um, probably going to do more of that stuff as well. And then uh, look for Robbie and Jeremiah and those guys to do to do more stuff too that crosses paths with their interest. This morning, Robbie sent me a uh, a podcast episode about um, where H.P. Lovecraft has been uh, influence an influence over uh, the comic book world. So um, we're doing a little bit of everything, guys, and uh, glad that you are here uh, along for the ride as we sort of get better at this and sort of. Um, just try to share our interests with the world, and uh, we hope you like it. If not, too bad. <laughs> We're going to do it anyway. We will not be affected by opinion. <laughs> Certainly not public opinion, uh, popular opinion. But uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in. Please subscribe, and I will see you again soon.